Welcome to the Shrimp and Sivret Show, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Danny, I'm super excited to dive into this podcast world with you and get this show going. A little bit about myself. My name is Rob Shrimp, former first round draft pick at the Edmonton Oilers and a 15 year professional career. I've now pivoted out into player development and mentorship with players. Uh, I do many different things. I wear many different hats. I'm also in the, in the process of developing an NFT project. I do video work with players all over the world, and I also do team consulting. Danny, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you're up to and where you've been. Thanks, Rob. I'm Danny Savret. Uh, I played with Rob with the London Knights. Uh, we won a Memorial Cup in 2005. Uh, I still reside in, in London. I played uh, professionally for a number of years. I was drafted by the Edmonton Oilers uh, and then finished my career out in, in Europe. Uh, I'm uh, currently a coach for the uh, the Junior Knights uh, minor midget program, the U16. Uh, I really have a lot of passion in, in developing and, and educating kids on uh, on the, the hockey IQ that I've obtained throughout my career and uh, look forward to, to sharing with everyone uh, listening. I think everyone's going to be very fortunate to hear your thoughts on the game and see what your mind sees. Uh, I was fortunate enough to play with Danny in London. We had a great time together, won a championship together. We also got a great opportunity to play together in pro and be roommates. And we've had a, about a 17-year-long relationship and friendship, so uh, it's going to be great to dive in here with you listeners. Turns it over to Corey Perry. Perry for Rod Trapp. Snaps and scores! Robbie Trapp's first of the tournament. Four nothing at night. Every week we're going to do a little segment called What Do You Bring to the Table? And this week I want to have Danny take over here. Danny, what do you bring to the table this week? I think, Rob, with, um, with the season's ending for minor hockey and heading into the offseason, I'd like to bring to the table the development aspect. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of people that want to be on the ice all the time. And the reality is the professional hockey player, when they're done their season, they're off the ice for at least a month, maybe two months, and really focusing on uh, the strength aspect, whether it be foot speed or, or just core strength or uh, mobility, stability. Uh, and, I, and I just I believe that uh, the younger player should focus a little bit more on that and less about being on the ice so often, because like, you, you know, it's so hard to build strength. It takes a long time, many days in the gym to keep building up your foundation of strength. And you can go weeks without playing hockey, stepping foot on the ice, and then probably within two or three practices or ice sessions, you're sort of back into the swing of things on how you should be feeling out there. So um, my advice, uh, feel free to chime in, but my advice uh, to those listening would be uh, if you have a, a young kid or if you're a, a kid that is striving to be a, a player, I would, uh, I would really focus on uh, getting into either a gym or some type of uh, dry land training off ice schedule uh, to build your foundation. And then, uh, and then as it gets closer to, to training camp or in your season, then slowly progress back onto the ice. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, I think there's definitely a, a window there to take some time away from the game. And I think it builds some hunger and it builds some, you know, some excitement to get back on the ice. A little bit of a break is, is key, I believe. Um, you know, it's, it's tricky with the younger kids and the younger ages. You know, they're at that age where development is such a focus. The game's changed so much since when we were coming up, you know, um, a lot of, a lot more private coaches and private ice sessions. There's so much more into the, in this, uh, development side of stuff. So it's tricky because there's a little bit of FOMO, but I think from, from your point of view and my point of view, that there is a ton of value in getting away from the game a little bit, taking the skates off. And, and I'm a big believer in two sports or even sometimes three sports, just playing other sports, the value of that. And I think it was huge just last week. You heard about, you know, you heard one of the greatest players ever play. Wayne Gretzky speaking about that, you know, taking the skates off and playing lacrosse, playing baseball, the value and the lessons you learn in those sports, you know, whether it's learning the shift in baseball or how to set your teammates up in, you know, running position or in scoring and scoring runs or in lacrosse, it's teamwork and, and making plays together and all these different valuable lessons and, and learning different, uh, you know, different personalities. You don't always have to be around hockey people. I think it's super valuable. So there's, there's some parts of it as well. Like you said, the development of the body and getting in the gym and training. And for me, I think the social side of it and the, the growth of the human um, overall is, is important as well to get away from the rink and, you know, just see different, different perspectives and different sports. And 
Um, it's tough right now though, because everybody's really driven. Everybody's really hungry. And I think, you know, I, I'm sure you've had plenty of conversations as well, Dan, but I, I get them all the time about like a parent asking me and I'll talk to anybody, but the parent going through this, you know, 35, 40 minute conversation. And I don't usually ask in the beginning, I say, okay, well, how old's your kid? And they get like, well, he's 10 or 11. <laughs> They're like, well, there's a long way to go before we're talking NHL. Um, it's more about enjoying the game. So I think the value of getting away from the rink is, is big and, and I like your point a lot. So, but it's, it's tough for people that are in it. They think they got that FOMO and everybody else is doing it. So it's a little tricky, but there's so much value in at least a month away from the rink and, and just enjoy other things. I think, I think also it's common knowledge uh, in, in all the major sports that the, usually the hockey players are the, the more well-rounded athletes, not really sports specific. So um, I, I know it has, like you said, it has shifted away to now trying to be a, a 12 month of the year type uh, sport, but I, I do highly believe in in taking some time away, whether it be uh, just not playing any sports or or getting shifting into a, a different sport or uh, just building the foundation of strength and and speed uh, to then um, utilize it and implement it throughout the the season. But um, what uh, now that I brought that to the table, what do you bring to the table for us? What I got for the table today is the answer: no. And right now is a, is a time when youth players are going through tryouts, um, going through their training camps, trying to make the team for next year. And I think it's a big topic in, in how players and families are, how they accept the answer no. And I think, you know, a lot of kids and families get very disappointed at this time when they don't make the team. There's only so many roster spots. But what I think is important is how they accept that and what they do with the no. Um, you know, some players get down, get defeated, and, you know, they lose their confidence. I think, you know, the best way to go about it really is, is using that for gas in your fire. And, you, you know, go back to a guy like Marty St. Louis. How many knows did Marty St. Louis get? And look what he became. Um, you know, you use these examples, but, and I know it's tough in the time, but that's why I wanted to bring it to the table today because I know this is the time when tryouts are happening. I know you just had tryouts just recently, and I'm sure you had to tell some people no. And, you know, if that player that you told no this year comes back next year and makes you say yes, you know, that player is not going to always be a no. It's, it's how, what you do as a player, how you accept it and which way you go about it. And, you know, I think it's a good, it's good sometimes to get that. No, it, it builds fire and it builds, uh, it builds character and, and how you take it is important and, and don't let it be, you can be told no at 18 or 19 in a junior team and still make professional hockey. So the dream's never dead. It's just a matter of how you accept that or what you do with that. No, I think, like you said, accepting it, um, I think playing at, you know, what you, what the, the player that received the no would deem as a, a lesser uh, um, either organization or skill level is sometimes better for the player. You're getting more puck touches. You're uh, becoming a bigger role for your team uh, versus trying to stay afloat. You're more striving in, in the opportunity. So um, just to touch on your point of, of anyone that, sort of feels dejected in, in being either sent down or uh, playing in their mind in a, in a lesser league or with a lesser team. Uh, I think, I think relishing in the opportunity to take on a bigger role uh, will, will help develop throughout the year. Absolutely. Confidence is King. And I think making that team and playing a very limited role versus like you said, going to another spot, getting more puck touches, more opportunity, maybe being a key player. Um, building that confidence again over over a year's time that can change everything coming back the next year with more confidence more control of your game and a better player really is something that will benefit you longer in the, in the uh, bigger picture here we go a couple of rookies Zamek a couple of underagers 16 year olds yeah. and Sivret both punching visors right now. That's got a smart. Oh, both bonnets come off, and the throw-in continues. Wiseman might want to stay out of there and let these guys fight without the bonnets for a moment. We're going to do it. Look at this. Look at these two kids go. Zamek a couple on top and underneath. Okay, so the first clip, I, I just wanted to show that T Tampa was attacking the offensive zone with, with minimal to no support. And just a, an example here of coming with no speed, no support. Kucherov tries to have to do everything himself. And Stamkos is just posted up on the, the blue line, really giving no option. I think the, the, the best option for uh, a team would be to was be able to flying through the neutral zone with speed, four, four players filling four lanes. 
giving the passer multiple options to to make a pass to gain entry to the zone. But as you see, uh, Toronto just sort of smothers them. They're they're in high pressure situation just inside of the blue line, and when you don't have much support uh, or uh, passing options, it doesn't really uh, bode well for you. Here's another clip of of Kucherov knifing through the neutral zone. Again, two guys have the ability to to flank the walls and giving him three passing options, but Again, you can see uh, Stamkos and Hedman are, are sort of pinned up inside, just outside the blue line, which doesn't really give Kucherov much passing options, and you're relying solely on one individual to, to gain entry into the offensive zone. In the, the third clip here, uh, they're slowly starting to get it. Uh, Tampa has now made their drop pass, which they go to all the time. They're now attacking with a little bit more speed. I just like to see Killorn match that speed of, of points and sort of finish his route but as you see, Tampa, uh, Toronto does a really good job of, again, holding the blue line, pressuring just inside the, inside the blue line because there's not much uh, passing help there for them. And again, Toronto easily breaks up uh, their, their power play entry. Then lastly, they get a smooth entry here where they go back to the drop again. They rely on point and Kudrov to attack. They're more situated uh to to give a passing option to the flank on the outside and point would travel through to the uh goal line and headman will come back up top uh to be an outlet up up top so just with three three guys attacking the uh, tampa relies heavily on uh point and kutrov and i think toronto knows that uh stamkos is pretty uh not not very relevant and neither is headman in the in the break in entry uh and you just you're putting all the emphasis on two players just trying to attack and then i just wanted to throw in um just the element of speed i think uh, i think what tampa is lacking is the speed element uh, off entry it, it allows uh, toronto to be able to stand up because there's no threat of anyone trying to knife through or beat them wide and and you know toronto can uh, stand up and pressure without uh, much uh, regard to anyone going wide so i just wanted to touch on here and then conversely here's edmonton uh flying with with three, with uh, one guy and, and two guys to a double swing, the, the wall guys are blasting up the wall uh, almost in full flight, and then the inside guys start making their route to the to the middle of the ice, giving uh, Duncan Keith four path four passing options, uh, and and obviously taking away the ability of of uh, LA to stand up. LA actually does a really good job in in trying to stand up, and fortunately for Edmonton, the puck ends up squirting through, and they get a a glorious chance out of it, but. I uh, just wanted to sort of highlight the differences of, of two different power plays where one uh, attacks with a ton of speed and uh, and Tampa obviously struggled uh, mightily against Toronto in uh, in game one. And uh, they they seem to sort of just be ad living and and not really very structured or, or coming uh, attacking with speed, just trying to solely rely on on two individuals to gain entry. And, and uh, Toronto did a very good job of uh, high pressuring them and um, and causing turnovers and uh, like I said, Tampa really struggled to to gain entry into uh, the offensive zone on the power play. Yeah, watching the clips, it's, it just seems like, for me, it, it, they're waiting around almost. You know, they're waiting. They're just waiting around. I think from for me personally, being on the power play, it's it's so important to have the ability to make reads and and find the cracks. And you see this a lot with the drop pass, the drop pass breakout in the power play, and the zone entries, sometimes literally giving up the opportunity to just skate it in on their own this wide open lane and they wait off and they wait for this drop pass. And then what happens is the drop pass guy winds up coming through and trying to knife through or trying to dangle through essentially eight players standing between the red and the blue line. It's, it's not easy to do. And, that, and it makes it very easy for the defending team on the PK to gap up because there's so much traffic there. So it's very predictable, but which lane is going to be a, a possibility. Um, and like you said, I felt like watching those clips to think like, there's no options. You know, Stammer's kind of not really in a spot where you could give him the puck. There's, there's like other guys standing around. And if you give him the puck, it's an, it's an immediate breakdown, you know, so those options are limited. So it makes the read simpler for Toronto. And that's something along the lines of, if you're on the power play, like sometimes you just make the read and go, like if you can get in, get in, like that's the most important part. And I think watching some of these struggling power play teams in the NHL level, at least, and I, and you can imagine it's probably, we're talking about high level hockey players here. Like you can talk about a peewee team or a Bantam team. Um, 
imagine them, like they don't understand these details either. They just see what they saw on the NHL level and they don't understand. So that's, that's part of the reason why we're here too, is to kind of break down these things and show exactly what the details are, what the reads are, what makes it easy for a PK and what makes it, you know, what the pain points are for a struggling power play. And like you said, in that game last night, you were there in person. So you could see it with your own eyes. And then obviously watching it on the TV, it's, you know, you watch these, the structure side of it, you're on the power play, you got five, they got four and you're going to break in and you got two guys that are in no man's land <laughs> and aren't options. Yeah. It, it really, it really um, swung the momentum in the game. I know, I know Tampa had an early power play uh, and then they ended up getting another, uh, another one that was five, uh, five minute major. And you would assume something will click there, but it, it, it wasn't so much that they didn't score. It was the fact that they just couldn't gain entry. And the, the, the crowd was just sort of building up um, as the time started to wear off. And actually Toronto got majority of the chances on the shorthanded um, man advantage, disadvantage. And, uh, and, and it was just frustrating to watch because it, it seemed like they just weren't on the same schedule. Like they're, uh, there was a lot of swinging and and it wasn't like they just ever set up behind the net and got into their uh, power play uh, breakout. But, um, but yeah, like you said, they, they, they stretch it out and they want to flip it back to their two guys, uh, which creates the gap there. Um, but g- guys are paid a lot of money just to be good penalty killers and, um, and they can pre gap and re gap. And when Tampa is just sort of sitting idle on the blue lines, as I think they call them anchors, um, you know, they sort of were an anchor and in, in weighing them down on the power play. But I, I like to see if uh, Tampa started to attack more with speed, like similar to what we saw in the Edmonton power play. It doesn't have to be a double swing, but um, as you cross the blue line, having four guys uh, carrying lots of speed, I, I don't think Toronto would feel as confident trying to stand up on the blue line, knowing that uh, a, just a chipped puck would result in probably a, a break or a, or a two-on-one opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's the point is, and I saw this with Washington. I like what the way Washington does it. I'm not saying I'm not a fan of the drop pass break. I I like it, but it's got to be executed, right? You got to find the speed, the timing and the speed at the proper time. And what I see with Washington is Johnny Carlson rushes the puck up in the neutral zone and three Washington capitals. You swing way back behind. So Johnny skates it up. He makes the PK box in the, in the neutral zone pucker. They all have to like, come into him and then he just turns around and whips it. So he's brought everybody to the middle of the ice. And that's what the power play is when you get in zone. And it's also in the neutral zone. It's about making the PK box contract and expand and screwing with gaps in the neutral zone and trying to get in the break. And you're messing with those gaps. You're messing with their timing and spacing. So I like how they only burn one guy on that. And then they throw it back to three guys just buzzing. And they're pretty good hockey players. The guys that are back there, you're talking about Backstrom, Kuznetsov and uh, you know, Ovi and those are good players, but I guess it's, that's maybe a moot point. It's not really, not only are they good players, but the, the setup is proper. It gives them a chance to succeed because they come with three guys with that blazing speed and they got like, then they start two on oneing people with speed and zone entry is that's what it's about finding the way to two on one, somebody with speed to get that entry. And for me, the other thing is the, the, the focus of these, these zone entries, I don't know what it is, but like everybody wants to get like 10, 15 feet inside the blue line and then kick it wide. Like the main thing is, is like to get it deep in the PP, like you get it down deep. And then again, the PK box has to come down and then you start moving it around and then you get it back up high. Then they, ex- then they expand. And then you, you know, you keep doing that until you get them tired. And then that's what opens up the wide open hole. Well, what, again, with that PP entry now with the drop pass one, there's, I mean, they're killing a lot of teams are killing 30, 40 seconds attempting this two or three times where it's, and you know, it might sound weird coming from my mouth, but like, sometimes you just get it in. And I remember when we had really successful PP in London, I know that was a long time ago, but we didn't have a really tricky snazzy breakout. We just got it in and we supported each other. Everybody we uh, supported everybody everywhere. You had anchors everywhere and you had your outs. So if we rim the wall, rim the puck around the left side and it's coming around the right side, one guy would go get it. And his options were simple either take it if you got the time and space, or if you're about to get hit, let it go. And there's a guy right behind you to grab it. Then those two guys are on that side and the guy get, takes the hit, lets it go to the next guy. And then if someone else comes to at him and then he just does the next anger to the D back of the blue line. So there's your out and there's your control. Simple, really simple and effective. Cause I think you waste 30, 40 seconds on this zone entry. Like what's the carrot. You're not going to get breakaways. Mm. You're not going to get pure breakaways on a power play 
not many. I'm not saying it's impossible. McDavid can do it because he's <laughs> like he's got super turbo. It's insane what he's got for speed. But on a whole, I think there's so much empathy. And I don't understand what the carrot is and what they um, – what's the right word? Like, I think everyone's trying to make it so complicated that it's like it needs to be something – superb right and and i think the the most important uh, aspect is is attacking the line with speed and finishing your routes right if, if you're if you're stopping up at the blue line or you're stopped at the blue line like you're not much of an option or serviceable i, I really only see the the high defenseman as the guy that probably should be the guy that's stopped up whereas the whether you're running a four forward unit or three forwards and a d like those four skaters need to be attacking the blue line and gaining entry with speed. And then, like you said, kick it to the half wall, kick it down low, maybe use the backside of the net to go change side and then come back up to the, the stationary defenseman up top. But um, it was just, uh, you know, it, I don't want to say it, it, it was the reason why Tampa had lost, but, but for sure it was a big momentum swing when you have uh, your, your sort of blue collar players on, on Toronto, just outworking, uh, a really talented group of players in, in Tampa. And, and then the crowd just got behind them and, and, and things started to snowball for, for Toronto, but um, it, it made to be somewhat of an uglier game uh, as a fan watching uh, unbiased fan watching the game. Uh, it was, it, you know, it, it, there was a lot of special teams and uh, it, it tr Tampa for whatever reason just seemed very flat. And I don't know if it's the way that they came out or if it was in due because the early power plays where you can't get everyone on the roster on the ice, uh, it, it just, it seemed like they just didn't have much in the tank, which seemed odd to me. I thought uh, a team with, uh, you know, good Stanley cup experience, uh, knowing they're going against a, a team in Toronto, that's, you know, starving to make the second round, especially at home in, you know, what the, you know, on Torontonians would call the Mecca of, of hockey, uh, I, I, I assumed there was going to be a, a bit bigger push by, by Tampa or, or they would put up a better a fight or game, but it was uh, it was an ugly showing by Tampa. So hopefully uh, they uh, correct some things. And, and one thing that hopefully they correct is their power play entries. Maybe it was, a, maybe it was the Trojan horse, man. Maybe it was the gift. Maybe they're, they're hiding inside. <laughs> they're going to get through the gates and explode. Yeah, no, it was flat. It was definitely flat performance and you can see, I think the good keys to take away from that are that zone entry stuff. That's, that was a big pain point for them. Um, and it killed a lot of momentum and that, you know, how it is in the playoffs, power play wins and loses series. So um, that's, that is brutal. And once he's a PP guy, if you jump out over the bench and you go over what I mean, over a five minute PP, it's like, Oh shit. We were excited. Now it's like, you know, they, and like you said, they were coming, Toronto was coming chance after chance. It's, total opposite of what you're expecting. Um, I think I, I heard something today. I was watching through social media and Christopher Stieg was saying that it was Kucherov's white tape. So if, if Kucherov comes out in game two with black tape, then we should all watch out. And you can't put it any higher in the net than that without drawing iron and missing or missing the net completely. Rob Shrepp won't officially get a point in this game, but he does find the net when it matters most. Well, there it is. A little row, crawling. row, row your boat. So a little preference to this clip. And again, this was a different tale of two takes. This was St. Louis, who had a very successful night in the PP. And I love their activity here. We're going to take a look at Ryan O'Reilly here and watch his movements. And you can see here, I highlighted him in this space. Inside of this, P, inside of this PP, uh, PK box, watch this guy's movement and how he moves around. He anticipates where the puck's going to go. Versus standing there in the middle of the ice and just being like, okay, I'm the bumper. I'm just going to stand here. Now we'll watch as this play plays out his movement. He starts swinging and moving with the puck as it's coming around the box. And we'll watch how this plays out. And literally four seconds down the road, he gets in the slot. One timer comes in and we get a bang, bang play there. And it's just, again, it's, it's a little bit of anticipation reading the play as the bumper guy. There's no, I can't give you the exact route of like, go exactly here and you're going to get a scoring chance. It's more about like anticipation and movement. And I think what's important there for the bumpers when you're moving around is you start swinging around and you start moving around and you become a difficulty for the PK because it's, it's a situation. If you start moving a little bit higher, it's like, okay, am I the, is if I'm a PK guy, am I PK four? I'm like, Hey, is that my guy? 
if I'm a PK defenseman in front of the net, do I go chase that guy? You're moving around, you're constantly changing your attack angle and you're making it difficult because again, you're, you're forcing the PK to communicate and figure out who's actually covering you. And then when it comes into the position is when we talked about a second ago, like if you're running this power play off the side where it's a one-timer coming into that guy, it, it's so difficult. Again, who takes them? Is it the strong side PK forward? Is it the weak side PK forward? Is it the strong side D? Is it the weak side? You, know, you get these kind of confusion going on. And what I'll show a little bit of here in this next clip is Tampa and how unactive their bumper is. And you watch Braden Point in the front of the net here. Kind of watch how it's very lethargic in my mind, in my opinion. Just kind of floating around, just standing there. And you can see he's standing put here. He's basically standing right by the defenseman. And we can see in this moment, Muzzin's, he's covering both guys. Doesn't have to do much. And right now in this setup, with this bumper being stationary, not moving, not doing much, this makes it where if the half wall guy, he can shoot it on net here, but this is a situation where it's, you're just chucking it and hoping. It's really not the shot you're looking for on the PP. You know, you're kind of looking for that threatening shot, the, the ability to score off that shot threat, not just, well, there's some people there. Let me chuck it and hope. So in my opinion, it's the bumper and he needs to be more active here instead of standing in front and just standing next to the fence and standing next to coverage. I think he could be more active here and get moving around. And you can see here inside of this setup, Toronto basically has these guys pinned into this side. Their coverage has the right side of the ice blocked out. And this is the, you know, this is a two on one here. Well, let's see if, if, you know, number 21 moves around a little bit, just gets a little bit of motion. You see how that changes the picture a little bit. Next thing you know, maybe Kucherov could pass that into him. And now he's coming in a different area for a threat and make Muzzin make a decision, make a move, make him think, maybe pull him away from the net. And if he pulls him away from the net, maybe that's the opportunity to shoot that towards the net with Cologne in front. But instead it gets moved around <clears throat> very stationary bumper guy. And what we have here is a turnover. And what I'll say is that this is a much different picture than what we're looking at with an active bumper. And we're looking at this face here, smiles, hugs versus a back check in misery. Now in this segment, we like to go over uh, our, our bets, our betting options uh, with our friends from points bet Canada, which are now live in Ontario. Fortunately for me, uh, I'm able to uh, put in my bet and for game two, um, I, I would like to probably do a parlay, a four game parlay where I think Boston's going to come back on Carolina. So I got Boston in game two. I'm taking Tampa to even things out, uh, in that series. Uh, I'm going to uh, give some love to my, to my buddies out in Edmonton, uh, over, over LA. So I got Boston, Tampa, Edmonton, and I think St. Louis is going to take a two nothing lead over Minnesota. So that's my four game parlay. Shrumpy, what do you got? Yeah, I, I like, I like Tampa coming back with a strong game too. I thought game one was just a lackluster effort. I, I see them buzzing back. Like it was bad hockey by them. And I see them coming back there. I think it was a Trojan Trojan horse play. I think it was planned out. They were going to go out and lay an egg and then <laughs> come guns blazing game, game two to five. So I like, I like Tampa coming back. I'm, I'm a believer in Carolina. I said it before the series. I still believe in them. I like their game a lot. They're young and fiery and they just, they, they're coming fast right now. So Carolina's, uh, I'd like that pick. Um, I, I would have a, t I'm having a tough time with St. Louis, M Minnesota. I like St. Louis a lot. I see a lot of pride in Minnesota though. I see them battling back. So I, it'd be, I would stay away from that one personally. And Edmonton, I thought they were buzzing last game. Um, Quickie played very well, save LA pretty strongly there. I, I see Edmonton coming back. So if I was to put a parlay together, I cannot do that from Latvia. I'm not in Ontario, but if I was, I would take that uh, Tampa, Carolina and Edmonton parlay. And if I were to take uh, a money line play, I would take, um, I think I would take Edmonton plus, uh, sorry, Edmonton minus one and a half would be my bet. Thanks for your bets, Trumpy. Um, best of luck in, in that and everyone who is uh, betting and uh tune in next week and if uh if you get a get a second give us a follow on instagram or twitter uh at rob shrimp at danny Savret, or at shrimp and Savret show
Thanks for listening to another episode of the Shrimp and Savrette Show. Don't forget to subscribe to the Nation Network YouTube channel to watch all of our video breakdowns. 